And I am joined this evening by a team of lead teachers who will be helping in various capacities behind the scenes, helping us things run as smoothly as possible. Um, we are so excited tonight to have Jessica Lorenz, a high school teacher from Bellingham Public Schools in Massachusetts, join us um, for our conversation. And she will be sharing her school's journey towards full integration of green chemistry principles um, that they've been on over the last seven years. To get our evening started, um, I'd love to invite everyone to tell us a little bit about you. Um, please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat by sharing your name, location, and the grade level you represent. Uh, please make sure that the name that we see on your screen is the name you would like to have printed on your certificate of attendance for this evening. Uh, this is how Beyond Benign gets your name to create those certificates and to get them sent out to you. Additionally, if you're comfortable doing so, uh, we welcome and encourage you to share your video feed um, throughout the, the webinar tonight as it fosters a more intimate and engaging experience. We do certainly understand that there are occasions when that's not possible and we are very understanding of that as well. Also, if you haven't done so already, please feel free to join us on any of our social media accounts. Um, we are at uh, Beyond Benign um, on all the different accounts that you see on the screen. We're always super excited to see posts um, of, of uh, people around the country and the world sharing not only Beyond Benign content that they're using, but also the innovative ideas uh, that they are using in their own classrooms. Um, around green chemistry practices and ideas, as well as imp inspiring stories uh, within our green chemistry community. I would also like to remind everybody um, that by registering for the webinar series, you have also agreed to our code of conduct. We are essentially asking for participants to be kind, accepting and open to varying viewpoints and opinions. The series is being recorded. And while it's expected that the video feed will just be focusing on the presenter, your voice and video feed could appear at some point. So by attending this discussion, you are giving your consent to allow us to post video and or sound of you. As we launch into our webinar this evening, we wish to acknowledge this unceded land in which Beyond Benign operates. For years, it has been the traditional land of the Pawtucket and the Massachusetts nations. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide, colonialism, and forced removal from this territory. We also acknowledge that further education is needed on our part to learn the full history of the land we occupy and all the indigenous people it belongs to. We would also like to give thanks to our sponsors who make our Observe, Wonder, Think webinar series possible. So as many of you probably already are aware, Beyond Benign is an organization working to foster a green chemistry community that empowers educators to transform chemistry education for a sustainable future. It's our vision to ensure that chemical building blocks of products used every day are healthy and safe for humans and the environment. And we believe that education is the most powerful and critical component to achieving this. That is why we are so committed to pioneering a paradigm shift across the continuum of science education. The reality is that there is a demand for green chemistry skills, and we don't currently have the workforce equipped to solve sustainability problems using chemistry. We're so excited to feature presenters in our Observe, Wonder, Think webinar series who are working to change this. I'd also like to highlight um, our green chemistry teaching and learning community. In October of this past year, so just a couple months ago, this community launched. This is a joint initiative between Beyond Benign and the ACS Green Chemistry Institute with support from the sponsors um, that you have seen on the screen. Um, this space is a space for all of us to share, connect, learn, and grow. The GCTLC hosts a central online searchable library of green chemistry education resources, including but not limited to lab experiments, lecture materials, in-class activities, um, some online books. The hub allows users to create, um, connect, and network together, share ideas and resources, collaborate, and give and receive feedback as well as mentorship opportunities. So if you haven't already joined uh, this community, uh, we would highly encourage you to do so. 
As many of you already know, uh, this year, our webinar series is highlighting the 12 principles of green chemistry um, with uh, short, engaging classroom learning experiences and learning stories to highlight these principles. Jessica's story is, a, is Jessica's story that she's sharing with us tonight is her story of her high school's transition to incorporate a green chemistry mindset. And we will be focusing, or she will be focusing on six of the 12 green chemistry principles. So we're gonna get a whole bunch of, of uh, uh, green chemistry principles tonight, which will be awesome. Um, before she begins to share her school's journey and story, I'd like to take a moment to just briefly review these six principles that we're gonna be highlighting and focusing on this evening. So principle one, Waste prevention states, it is better to prevent waste than to treat or clean up waste after it's been created. This principle is often referred to as the prevention principle. The other 11 principles are the how to, to actually achieve principle number one. Jessica will also be focusing on principle number three, Principle three focuses on less hazardous chemical synthesis. So wherever practicable, practicable, synthetic methods should be designed to use and generate substances that possess little or no toxicity to either human health or the environment. Simply stated, the chemicals and materials used in affecting chemical transformations matter, and we need to pay close attention to the choices we make about what goes into that flask or that beaker. The focus of green chemistry principle four is the design of safer chemicals. The design of safer chemicals focuses on minimizing toxicity while also maintaining both function and efficacy. The American Chemistry Society states that achieving this goal requires an understanding of not only chemistry, but also of the principles of toxicology and environmental science. Green chemistry principle 10 highlights the need to design for degradation. Green chemistry focuses on optimizing function while minimizing both hazard and risk. So while principles three, four, five, and 12 focus on the reduction of hazards, green chemistry principle 10 really focuses on the design of products that degrade after use in order to reduce risk or harm. Uh, the level of risk is of course, both related to hazard and exposure, um, the contact between a chemical and a living thing. So designing for degradation can eliminate significant exposure, which therefore minimizes risk. Principle 11 highlights the need for real-time analysis for pollution prevention. Real-time feedback is, is essential in proper functioning um, of chemical processes. Most chemists are very familiar with laboratory analysis from their undergraduate training, but analysis can also be formed be performed in line, online, or at line in a chemical plant, a sub-discipline known as process analytical chemistry. Such analysis can detect changes in process temperature or pH prior to a reaction going out of control. Poisoning of catalysts can be determined and other del deleterious events can be detected before a major incident occurs. And finally, um, the final green chemistry principle Jessica will be highlighting this evening is principle number 12, safer chemistry for accident prevention. According to the American Chemistry Society, safety can be defined as the control of recognized hazards to achieve an acceptable level of risk. Green chemistry principle number 12 is known as the safety principle. This principle is the logical outcome of many of the other principles. In fact, it is practically impossible to achieve um, the goals of principle 12 without the implementation of at least one of the other principles. Eliminating before exposure before it can occur should always be the level of safety that we are all reaching for. So without further ado, I would like to introduce um, tonight's presenter, Jessica Lorenz. Um, I actually had the privilege to work with Jessica last summer um, in an online Beyond Benign course, and I'm so excited to hear her story tonight. Jessica has been teaching high school science with a focus in chemistry for 12 years. She graduated from Westfield State University with an undergraduate degree in chemistry with a minor in secondary education in 2012, and then completed her MAT in chemistry at Salem State University in 2015. Jessica is currently the Bellingham High School 812 Science Wellness Coordinator. Bellingham High School is located in Bellingham, Massachusetts. Jessica is also the Bellingham District Coordinator on top of teaching two sections of environmental science and two sections of chemistry. 
Over her last six years in Bellingham, Jessica has worked to build vertical alignment of science curriculum from grades pre-K through 12 by implementing PLTW curriculum at each grade level. Jessica's high school science team has also worked to review their current chemistry stockroom and laboratory experiments to become greener. Jessica has a passion for environmental science and chemistry, so to be able to work through making our laboratories a safer and greener space has been a fulfilling experience for her. As a final reminder before um, we get started, our goal tonight is to engage in an interactive session. So if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat. It is my pleasure to turn over the dialogue to Jessica Lawrence. Hi everybody, and thanks for joining us tonight. That was a great introduction of everything that I would say for this being so slide. I know um, my list of jobs is pretty lengthy for those who are educators and know how tough it is just to teach them and I also have my other roles, but I truly am you know, dedicated to improving our chemistry environment at uh, Bellingham High School. So um, that's where all this work really started was when I walked into our staff room when I was hired and realized how much work we needed to do. Um, so we move on. Second slide. See if I can get to some reason. A little button on the bottom has gone away. Um, sorry, I wonder if you could help. Advancing the slide, I guess, because for some reason what was up there before is no longer to advance the slide. Um, yeah, you're muted now. So I just unfortunately could not. Okay, did it go forward for you? Uh, no, not on my side. Okay, so hang on, something is weird on my end. I'm sorry, I apologize. No, it's all, we, we definitely practiced it for some reason. Yes, we did. <laughs> okay. No, it's all not right. On the screen anymore. Hang on. I apologize. I got to pull it back up again. My, my, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay. There we go. No, okay, so no. you should be good now, Jessica, I think. Yep, we're all set. Okay. Awesome. Apologies. Thank you very much. Let's see if it advances from one that we got. Oh, I went too far. Now it's going haywire. <laughs> All right, you know how it is online, right? We never know. So as um as the intro stated, when I was first hired to Bellingham High School, I came from a district that had a very strong sense of um organization for chemicals and had a very strong sense of safety. Um, my mentor teacher, you know, was in an analytical chemistry lab for about 10 years prior to teaching. So she brought all those skills with her and then I was able to learn from her. So when I transferred over to Bellingham, I brought all those skills with me in order to, you know, fix what I was seeing in Bellingham. So um, if you look at the first couple of years, so two years, if we focused on three, 10 and 12 as a team, um, I have a counterpart chemistry teacher and myself, so there are two chemistry teachers. And then I had about two or three biology teachers also who were interested in learning more about the chemical stockroom. Um, they were a very kit-driven district, so uh, most of their labs were all kits. And instead of having a chemist or a chemistry teacher create refill kits, they just purchased more kits. So we had a lot of chemicals that were not necessary. So, um, oh, Scarlett, can you hear me now? Thank you for letting me know. Uh, it's hard, uh, someone said it's hard to hear my mic. So is that a little bit clearer? There's an echo, hopefully, maybe from the... There the, was an echo. Um, yeah, the, the acoustics oh. in my, my room are not the best. All right, is that, that's better now? Closer to the screen. Okay. Um, yes. So, yeah, so 3, 10, and 12 was really what we focused on was being able to remove the chemicals that we knew we didn't need and also design labs that were more conducive to what we wanted to have in our building. So we did a lot of um, cleanup, we had chemical removal, um, and we organized our chemical stock room. Um, 2020 to 2022, 
that was when we again focused mostly on Flynn. So we used the Flynn disposal methods and also the Flynn chemical organization. Um, so it was a pretty streamlined process. It is also what I used in my previous district. I taught there for seven years. So it was very, very common, uh, very knowledgeable of what to go where and how things should be stored under the Flynn um, specific guidelines. So we focused on that. I also am lucky to have interns. So at my high school, we have seniors who are allowed to do internships. And these seniors already took advanced placement chemistry. So they were able to learn with me how to set up a chemical stock room, what doesn't interact properly with one another, why things go in a certain place, um, while they were also helping me organize our chemical stock room for the betterment of all of the teachers and the students in the building. And then from there, I realized that some of our labs were really not necessary uh, for the amount of waste that we were producing that was hazardous. So that's why I you know, joined the class this summer. And I also you know, started thinking about what can we do to reduce our waste? How can we make our labs more on a micro scale versus you know, having large beakers of chemicals? How can we get away from using lead? So we really worked together as a teacher, um, two chemistry teachers and my interns to start looking at different labs. So that's actually how I found Rambinon was through a grant that we had that we could purchase new chemical kits. So I went through Flynn because as you can tell, they're like my favorites and I tend to buy things from them and they are always great customer service uh, and I tend to buy great labs. I uh, ordered everything that I could that was considered greener. Um, then my interns, in turn, were able to try those labs and see if they got out of them. So let me see what my next slide is. I think I may be going into that. Yep. So um, here are the seven labs that we did research on, um, myself and my interns. Uh, we actually currently are doing two and seven in our lab right now. So to making the chemistry lab greener was actually fantastic. One of my uh, interns started it, but then we had midterms, so she didn't get a chance to finish it yet. So we ran it on the smaller scale, and now we're planning on running it on the more advanced scale. So they had two options. So uh, that one, I would turn back, turn to green now that it is an, a viable option to add to your curriculum. Um, also, micromole rockets, unfortunately, um, we didn't find beneficial. Um, we tried it and it was cool, but in my opinion, not cool enough. But uh, we tried it uh, and my intern was actually uh, bummed. Yeah, she was bummed. She tried it and she looked at me and she said, that wasn't a loud enough pop. Like, cause it was a little bit of a pop, but not something that was as, you know, extravagant. Um, to give some background knowledge about that micromole uh, rockets, there are two different chemical reactions that they have to do uh, and produce uh, a pop. And unfortunately, in my lab, we were allowed to do methane bubbles. So students actually filled a bubble with methane and lit it on fire. So I think because the fact that they did that, she was less um, enthused by the micromole rockets. But if you had a student that's never done a reaction like that before, they would have fun doing it. Um, so this is basically what we started was just trying them ourselves. Uh, number four, I know, I think is a benign, a benign one. Number four, we actually had a problem with the first year that we ran it. So if you are thinking of trying this, I have put a note, they have to be very, very tiny, tiny pieces of um, the plastic in order for it to actually work. My intern last year tried it three times and couldn't get it to work. Um, and, but my intern this year, she was very proud of herself. She took standard level chemistry, which in my building is the lower level chemistry for students who are not thinking of going into science field or students who are struggling in math. And she asked me my intern and I, you know, have mentioned her here. So she was very excited that she was able to fix this lab and make it work on her own by just trying it um, in different methods and cutting the plastic in different manners. So these seven, if you're looking at labs that are greener to replace your current labs, 
would be all very great choices, in my personal opinion, to switch out for what you may currently be doing. So Jessica, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Um, on the, the number two lab, the making the, the chemistry lab greener, can you kind of like highlight like what was the like what 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 is that activity about? I have to pull it up to tell you the truth because this is oh, the, sorry. Uh, the no the interesting part about these labs is I let my interns do them. Uh -huh. So they are near me when they do them in the classroom, but they run them on their own. I've actually never run that in my classroom yet. But okay. I wanted to because she started the research. Um the only thing I thought I think there was like beeswax involved and something else that she's never worked with prior. So she thought it was interesting. I'm not sure if it was a creation of a greener plastic um, type of lab, but she thought it was interesting that those those things were not in an everyday lab. So okay. I can try and pull it up after if you want and just we can, I can please look it over. Um, I just can't remember from memory because she's, no part, <laughs> yeah, she's currently <laughs> working on it. So it was literally last week that she said, I like this. I want to do some more research on it. So I apologize. Okay. No, okay. okay. um, let me see if I can think of one that was, oh, uh, number six was really great also for anyone who's interested in environmental science, the toxicity of road de-icers. From my memory, that one had to deal with growing some seeds to determine if um, the road ices were toxic or not to um, plants and, or grasses that were, or even any type of yeah, plants that are off of the roads. Um, so my interns who love the thought of thinking of, because we have so much up here in Massachusetts, so they just throw all this road salt down and it can affect, you know, well water and it can affect plant life and all that. So she had some really great results from that lab, which could be either run in a chemistry lab um, setting or it could be run in an environmental science class. So I actually luckily teach both. So I could definitely run that in my environmental science class to show them the importance of using the right type of you know, de-icer instead of impacting our environment like we have in a negative way. All right, so those are the seven that we I did recently. I'm gonna see what, um, Thank you. I'm um, trying to see if anybody has questions. So, uh, if I, don't, I wasn't following the chat. So if anybody has questions, please stop me. Um, so here is something I wanted to share with anyone. I'm big on sharing everything. I'm not that teacher who likes to hold on to my stuff. So if there's anything you need, I'm always open to sharing it and showcasing what I've done. And you can take it, edit it in any way. Um, I'm hoping I put all the links as view only and not edit access. So I'll double check those. So hopefully you don't edit my documents, but you can make your own. Um, so um, like we said, with the pre-made kits that even the seven on the previous slide, um, they weren't perfectly aligned to what we currently are doing. And I found that some of them were good add-ons. Um, I found that some of them may be able to take over one or two of the labs that I've run prior. But what we're moving towards now is how can I take my current labs and create them or rework them to make them be greener. So we started working on that. Luckily this summer I worked on one, which is our chemical reactions lab. I have, um, let's see, this is the, the, the presentation that I created and this is the lab itself. So you're welcome to use that if you're interested. I know that if anyone here is a chemistry teacher, anytime you do reactions lab, there's always a plethora of waste. And you can have a small amount of waste. You can have a large amount of waste. We have actually redone this lab four times prior. But over the summer, with the help of Erin, I was able to really hone in on what was important um, and have it be greener. I see the question down there. What are the Flynn 360 science? Let me see. I was just reading that. Yeah, what are the Flynn 360 science models on my is not? Um, so the Flynn 360 science, um, you have an online option that you can use for the students if you'd like to. I've actually never 
use that side of it because I was more interested on the hands-on in-person lab experience for them. But if you are a tech-savvy person and you're really interested in being able to use an online platform for grading, for work submission, um, that's what the Flynn 360 platform does for you. It adds on some more. Um, the Flynn 360 platform also has different scaffolding of their labs. So you can go from an inquiry lab that lasts only 30 minutes for those of you who have a really small time span to an advanced inquiry lab that could you know, last 90 minute blocks if you have a block schedule. So they have scaffolding built in, which is pretty in interesting that they've done that. I've not seen that in the past. In the past, when this gives you a practice, you run that lab and it's pretty prescriptive. They're trying to lean more towards inquiry based and they're trying to make it more critical thinking based. So that's when 360 comes in. So like I said, I haven't really dived enough into the 360 side, but the labs itself are are great. And I use whatever one fits for the group that's in front of me, whether it be a 30 minute lab or an advanced inquiry lab. So that access comes with the purchase of the kit usually. Um, and you can also purchase the kit separately if you're not interested in the 360 for some of them. Blue, it's just a question. Um, let's see. So moving on, the last thing that I wanted to touch upon was these two things here for anyone who's interested. I don't know if we're going to get live on the phone. So we can pull it up if you're interested in seeing, but the HRS chemistry laboratory experiment. So what I did was I went through all of the labs that we currently do, and I um, put them all live links. So anyone interested in taking a look at the procedures, um, if you want to pull them and try them yourself, they're all there. Uh, we also started a HS waste disposal procedure. So as I said, we're, we're fortunate enough to have interns. So our interns are capable of helping us with our waste. So they can go onto the Flynn website, use proper waste disposal procedures, in order for us to get rid of our waste in a greener way. So the students then can go to our disposal procedures and look up the most common waste that we have from our labs so that they can do it for us um, and learn at the same time. So we're really trying to dive more into those 12 principles of students having the ability to try this stuff when they're at the high school level. I do plan on also implementing this more in my classroom, not just with my interns, so that we have a larger group of students involved. Uh, I teach advanced placement chemistry as well. And after the AP exam, it's a great time to dive into this material and have students learn more about the 12 principles and how to make things greener and why we do the things we do um, and why we don't do certain labs anymore that we used to do in AP chemistry. So that is another plan that I have with my um, coworker in order to move this forward and continue to think greener so that we're not having waste. That is hurting our environment. I think I forgot to mention that we are not connected to a wastewater treatment facility when it comes to our water. Um, it goes right into, you know, basically right into the ground in the back. So I'm not sure how much waste has gone down on our streets that have already polluted our well waters or our, you know, surrounding area. So we're trying to make sure that we stop that pattern. Um, so that's like the, the general outlines where I know we wanted to give some chance for people to ask questions or I can go over some of the labs that I've done um, or I can go, you know, more into actual details of what we did in each one of these couple of years if you're like oh my chemical stock room is just like what she said and how did she actually tackle it uh so if anybody has questions or wants me to dive anything more specific uh but that's my general story of progression of going from hazard to greater i tend to talk fast too so i apologize erin <laughs> I'm I'm wondering, Jessica, if you can maybe dive in a little bit to that that first stage from 2018 to 2020 when you were. I mean, you talked about you had a lot of extra kits, a lot of extra chemicals. Like, how did you go about 
going through that waste removal process, does your district have like a process for that? Or did you guys find grant money to, to have somebody come in and help you with that? Like, how did you, how did you do that? So luckily I had the skills from my previous um, mentor um, to what was high, extremely hazardous, um, what was, you know, some are hazardous and what could, you know, go down the drain. I also don't use our when uh, on the CR sheets in order to refer back to disposal methods. So as a team, I think at that time we had a team of five, we were able to use professional development time to reorganize our chemical stock room. So my building principal was phenomenal and he also was hired the same year as myself. So I went to her and I said, this is something that needs to be fixed now. Um, we had way too many hazardous chemicals in there that were actually reacting with one another because they were um, in the wrong chemical storage cabinets together. So we removed everything. And as we were removing, we organized um, on lab benches. And then from there, we were able to consolidate and react anything that could go down the drain once properly neutralized. And then we kept some because some of the materials were, you know, or some of the chemicals are still usable. I think anything that was too hazardous, we did have to pay for chemical, um, chemical, um, well, hazardous waste removal. So we did have a company come out and take the most hazardous chemicals. So our district no longer wanted alkaline metals uh, in the building because of their, you know, explosive nature. So those were all removed. Um, they wanted to remove magnesium metal, but I asked them not to because it has fantastic reactions if done properly. So we kept our magnesium metal in a flammable cabinet. Um, but that was the general process with a team of five professional development time with me as the background knowledge, because I do have a chemistry background, even though it's a bachelor's degree, but you know, with a bad, if you look at the flame science, you make it sense. If you do not feel comfortable doing chemistry, please do not go through this process. So as long as you as a chemist are strong in your knowledge as to what's going to happen when you react chemicals, you can do that in a, a safe environment. So that was our general plan. It took us a year and a half or so. That's why I had two years there. Really to, to clean it all up, we actually had chemical, um, we went through OSHA certification in sort of a way. So we had everything removed down so that it was below eye level because you're not supposed to have anything above your head because it can spill on you. We had all of them put lips on. So we had a, um, our town carpenter came in and made specialized cabinets. Uh, we ordered some new corrosive cabinets along with um, acid cabinets that were locked and flammable cabinets that could lock so that everything was up to code. Uh, and that took us a good two years. Uh, luckily, the district was, you know, putting this in the forefront, so they did allocate district funds. So we did not have to go through a grant process. Awesome. Thank you so much. I always, I, I uh, get a lot of questions, like how, if I have, walk into a, a chemical, you know, stock room in my high school, um, not so much at the middle school level, like where do I go to actually make it safe? So that's an amazing process you went through and your school is so lucky to have you there. Oh, <laughs> thank you. No, I appreciate, <laughs> yeah. appreciate all the hard I work. Know, yeah, it's hard. It is hard work. And I appreciate um, Aaron Ratz's comment in the, in the chat to really advocate for yeah the paid time. If, if your chemical stock room is not looking good because <laughs> it is, yes, it's definitely. a lot of time, but definitely. it's so important. Mm -hmm. I'm also wondering, um, Jessica, can you can you dive in a little bit more to the your internship program that you all have created at the high school? I mean, that sounds like such an amazing opportunity for kids to really apply everything that they've learned in the classes um, that they've taken prior. How do you like what's your selection process or how do you how do you get kids excited about that? Um, what kind of mentoring do you provide like once they're in that position? Um, do you mind diving into that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So anyone here who is a high school teacher or actually can remember back to high school, you probably remember an internship as, oh, the educator puts the intern in the back room. They grade papers for them. 
you know, maybe they'll go make some coffees, maybe they'll go get them some coffee. And that's like, you know, the traditional internship setup that we all remember. And I was an intern and I remember grading and I remember helping my AP chemistry professor, you know, get everything ready for her class, get people make coffees. So I didn't want nothing, nothing against my AP chemistry professor. She was phenomenal. That was just what was expected back then. So what I wanted to do was not have that. So when I first came to Bellingham, I already had an internship program in Pembroke Public Schools, which is where I was prior. And Bellingham already had a small program where they had some students shadow or help teachers. So since I came in as the chemistry teacher and took on AP chemistry, I thought it was a great you know, starting point to have these kids in the lab and doing stuff that was relevant that they may have not had enough experience with in the classroom to prepare them for collegiate level or for going right into the workforce. So when I first started, it was really by word of mouth as to who would want to be an intern. So I kind of hand selected them. And I said, you know, you're doing really great in here. I noticed that you're really interested in chemistry. Would you want to do an internship with me next year? where I, you know, teach you a little bit more about the background of chemistry and, you know, you can work with me more as almost like a colleague versus, you know, my students. So from there, we were able to start the program. Uh, we used to only have one intern for a year, but so I have five. So it's just growing on its own through word of mouth of the students. And we have a lot of students who are highly interested in science along with biomedical science. We have a biomedical uh, pathway for Project Lead the Way. So with that, students can do an in-school internship. Um, that means that they get this internship credit where they're getting these hours without having to actually drive somewhere. Some of our students don't have the ability to um, drive and they don't have a car. So this allows them to get internship hours while still in the building. So when my students come in, they have a, basically a web I can share with anybody who's interested of uh, what they're expected to do each internship day, because it really shouldn't be as prescriptive as teaching. So it shouldn't be intern sits down, you tell them you have to do this today. It should be more on the intern to get up and start doing what they need to do, similar to what they would see if they were in a paid internship out on this in the summer. So the students really know that they have to check a Google form, which is where my staff can ask for help. So if my eighth grade teachers need help setting up a lab, they'll put in the Google form. My intern will walk to their classroom and ask them, how can I help you? So they're not only working with me, they're working with the entire science department to help them and support them, especially through lab prep. Because if you all hear, you know, the most tedious part of doing fun labs is the prep time. So having an intern who is trustworthy and safe and has the knowledge can set those up for you. I also am running it this year with a little bit more of a student-led research portion, which is what they're doing when it comes to doing these, um, these different labs, which is testing out labs, seeing how they run, see if they're interesting, and if they're not interested in them, what could they do to improve that lab? What could they do to make it more interesting for a student? What would they wanna see as a 10th grader um, when we run this lab? So that's their research portion they've been working on. I have two interns returning for my second semester. So that's the two that will work on the micromole rockets and work on the green, um, the green chemistry lab. So both of them will work on those and see if they can improve those. Uh, and I'm more than happy to share whatever they come up with with whoever um, at Flint just to tell them, you know, your labs are a good basis, but this is what Bellingham thought would be, might be more interesting. So it's just, we're always looking to make it more interesting and greener in the same regard. So like kids want to do something fun, but I don't want a lot of waste. So what can we do together to do that? So my interns are doing this, which is great on their resume, great for their interviews, if they want to go right into the workforce or if they want to go to college. So it is a fantastic program if you can get your school on board. I think it's just so it sounds so empowering for the for the kids and what a great way too to you know to also figure out 
how you can make experiments more green and more relevant and more applicable to, to kids' lives. So awesome exactly. work. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. All right, anybody else out there have some, any questions, um, specific questions for Jessica? Uh, this is Christina Perez. Uh, I actually, we're, I'm not a teacher. I actually work for the state of Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. Um, and while it's not a question, really, it's uh, hoping it could be a resource for for everyone here, because it was um, you had asked her the question of how did she dispose of the chemicals. Um, so we um, and I'm with the division TDEC division of management, but we also we have a program called the Tennessee School Lab Rehabilitation Program, where we provide the opportunity for K through 12 schools that have the labs and have the hazardous waste um, material where we'll go in, do education and outreach with it, but then we'll pay for that disposal of those chemicals. Um, and then of course, during that process, we strongly encourage that um, we to do the, to use those 12 principles and to do alternatives, but we, like I said, we'll pay for it, but we tell them it's a one-time disposal that we'll pay for. So I'm not certain if any other states have a very similar program, um, but that might be something for, because I don't know where everyone is from, but like I said, within the state of Tennessee, that is, uh, if anyone is from Tennessee, uh, that is a program that we do offer. That's amazing. That's fantastic. Well, I hope that you is. joined the green chemistry teaching and learning community, um, Christina. And I noticed that there's a group here from Tennessee, so that's cool. Um, because there are so many resources there and also other people doing this work all over the place. And so lots of collaboration and learning opportunities there and, and in this group too, I think a lot of the time. So, Yep. And Annette, another uh, of our lead, our, our previous lead teacher, I can't remember what you're called now, Annette. It's, it's like a... Uh, <laughs> elevated status um, was talking about that New York also has a, a, a clean sweep um, program through the DEC. So I think it's state by state, but yes, the green chemistry learning and teaching community is a great place to share those because I know a lot of, especially like the novice teachers aren't really sure where to start if they walk into something that looks like a big mess. Um, any other uh, uh, specific questions or comments out there? Notice there's a nice group here from Ohio too. That's oh. great when you have people just come together to kind of, because then you can really talk and collaborate and use it afterwards too. So welcome mm -hmm. to you all, call out. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move forward here. Let's see, let me grab some slides. Um, so again, a huge, huge shout out to, to Jessica for sharing her school's green chemistry implementation journey. Um, it's a it's a it's a big process and a big take um, to to really dive into all the different components from how you're storing and purchasing chemicals to how you start making smaller shifts, like going to the micro scale um, to try to reduce waste, and then really bringing in the voices of kids and empowering kids like through through Jessica's internship program. Um, it's, it, was, it's, it was really fun to hear sort of this comprehensive story of over a seven year journey. And I'm excited to see, you know, where, where um, your program goes to in the future, Jessica. Um, I would love to invite um, everybody right now just to think about um, Jessica's journey and what are some, some takeaways or, and or inspirations that you might have from her story that you could use to, to further your own get green chemistry journey, um, whether it's in your individual classroom or in a department or in a school or in a district or you know, in a private entity outside of the, the education world. Um, if you have any ideas or inspirations, we'd love to hear them either in the chat or feel free to unmute and just, you know, uh, free share um, your ideas. We'll give everyone a moment or two to think. I'm just going to thank Jessica in advance. Um, I like that you laid out eight labs because usually people feel 
a little bit stunted because where do I start? Where do I start? So thank you for laying the foundation and also, and also directing folks where they can get these actual labs. I love all those labs. I've bought all those kits and I actually extend them into other labs. So if you ever want to think about what else you can do with the same kits, um, there's a lot of resources on Beyond Benign that you can see from there. Thank you. I'll definitely take a look at those and, you know, go over, over them with my interns too, so we can see, you know, what other materials out there. It looks like Maria shared in the chat that um, she, I think that this journey's helped and that it makes it easier to go to science departments to implement cleaner science practices throughout a whole school and eventually the district. This made it a lot more palatable. Agreed. You know, hearing somebody else's journey and where they started from and where they ended up, yeah, it makes it, it, it makes it feel doable. This is inspiring. I love your internship program, and and I'm at a middle school level, but I we do have uh, student assistants, so kind of a a downgraded version of an internship program. But I'm thinking in my own mind, like how can I take some of the ideas that you've implemented, Jessica, and use them with um, kind of the younger younger folks that I'm, I'm working with. So food for thought for me. All right, so um, before we sign off uh, for this evening, and I will say that we are just gonna stick around um, informally after, after we formally finish the webinar. So if anybody wants to stay on and have some informal um, dialogue, uh, you're welcome to do that. Um, but prior to that, I would like to invite you to our next Observe, Wonder, uh, Think, uh, this is going to happen on Thursday, February 15th, which is four weeks from today. So it'll be six o'clock to seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Um, high school teacher Rox Derival and her students will be sharing their work with K-4 students. So last semester, Rox Science Ambassador high school students collectively taught over 200 elementary school students how to make safer crayons, paints, and soaps. And her amazing students are going to be joining us in our next webinar to share what um, they gained from that experience as emerging scientists and educators. Um, also, uh, please don't forget to join the dialogue on our social media accounts. Um, also, on the third Wednesday of each month, Beyond Benign does offer another interactive webinar, which features community leaders and active practitioners in the field with small group discussions, resource sharing, and networking opportunities with industry leaders and uh, the higher ed community. Uh, participants bring their own resources and share them out to the community. Their meeting time is from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which might not be convenient um, for all the K-12 teachers um, in the room for obvious re reasons. But if you do register for the webinar, you'll have access to the recordings, just like you do for tonight's webinar. And um, you may also wish to share the opportunity for this particular webinar with other educators and administrators who do not um, have classroom schedules to work around in order to increase their understanding of green chemistry. And if you haven't already done so, um, feel free to scan the QR code on the screen uh, for more information about the green chemistry teaching and learning community, as well as to remain current with the latest news and updates. And one last time, I would like to give a huge shout out to Jessica for sharing her time, her talent, and her positive energy uh, this evening with all of us. And thank you to all the participants for tuning in, uh, sharing your time as well, and being present in tonight's webinar. We look forward to seeing you again in a few weeks. Good night and take care. <laughs>